Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing complexins and neurotransmitter release. Right, so I'm discussing at the moment the formation of the core snare complexes, specifically uh, the zero ionic layer, and why synaptobrevin 2 is often referred to as an R snare, while syntaxin 1 and SNAP25 are often referred to as Q snares. So, R in R snare stands for arginine, and basically it's because synaptobrevin 2 here contributes uh, an arginine into this zero ionic layer, which remember is this interaction uh, between, um, well, it's an electrostatic interaction between the uh, four alpha helices of this snare proteins. Okay, right, so that's arginine. Now, let's turn our attention to Q, Q snare. What is the single letter amino acid that has the code Q? Well, basically, it's the amino acid glutamine. So Q is used to denote glutamine. And you might ask, well, why on earth isn't it denoted G or something? Uh, well, G is for glycine. So G was gone already. So uh, it ended up with Q. OK, so start with the generic amino acid structure again. Here's the amino terminus, the al alpha carbon with a hydrogen off it, the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay, and then um, the R group of glutamine, you have these three carbons, like so, and then off here you have an amino group down there. Okay, so this is a primary amide group down here. And then off all of these carbons you then have hydrogens. So this is the glutamine amino acid. Right, uh, now, um, basically what's going to happen is all three of these alpha helices here, these, these two turquoise alpha helices of SNAP25 and this blue alpha helix of syntaxin 1, they're, they're all going to provide glutamines at this zero ionic layer and synaptobrevin 2 is going to provide arginine. Now how is this going to work? Well basically, if we look at the structure of glutamine here, oxygen and nitrogen are bonded to carbon. Now. Uh, in, let's take this bond with the, between the carbon and the nitrogen. It's a single bond. So the carbon contributes an electron and the nitrogen contributes an electron. Now the two electrons in this bond are going to feel um, pulls. They're going to feel forces towards uh, the two nuclei of the carbon and the nitrogen because both the carbon and the nitrogen nuclei are positively charged. So these electrons are going to feel electrostatic interactions, attractions towards the carbon nucleus and to the nitrogen nucleus. Now, um, nitrogen, uh, the, the pull of the nitrogen nucleus on these electrons is greater than the pull of the carbon nucleus. So, these electrons, well, uh, firstly, let me just tell you what that that's called. When the nucleus of an atom has a greater pull on electrons than an another nucleus, we say its electronegativity is higher. So that's a big word. And electronegativity basically means how much the nucleus of that atom pulls on electrons. So nitrogen has a greater electronegativity than carbon. So it's going to mean that these electrons spend more, well, they sit closer, basically, to the nitrogen, which makes this bond polar. It makes the nitrogen slightly negatively charged and the carbon slightly positively charged. Now, it's the same for the carbon-oxygen bond here, these double bond, this double bond. Basically, the oxygen nucleus pulls on the electrons in this double bond uh, harder than the carbon nucleus, so they, they, they sit closer to the oxygen. So the, the oxygen becomes slightly negatively charged and the carbon becomes positively charged. This means that this end of uh, the glutamine becomes slightly negatively charged. So, what's going to happen then? Basically, if we draw the four alpha helices of this core snare complex, as it's called, here is the alpha helix of synaptobrevin 2 in orange here. Okay, here is the alpha helix of syntaxin 1, okay, and here are the alpha helices of uh, SNAP25, and they do indeed sit like this. You have syntaxin 1 next to Sna uh, synaptobrevin 2, so the other two can only sit like that. All right, so it's not, uh, it's not basically like um, you, you could have the two SNAP25 helices on this diagonal and then the syntaxin and synaptobrevin opposite. That's the other confirmation that would be possible, but it's not like that. It's this one here. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, 
what you um, have basically is the at the zero ionic layer, this orange alpha helix of synaptor brevin provides this arginine, which is positively charged. And this is going to look awfully cramped. The other three all provide these glutamines, Q, 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 which is all negatively charged. So that is how you get this ionic interaction at the zero ionic layer between these four alpha helices. Okay, so that's why Synaptor Brevin 2 is known as an R snare, whilst the other two, Syntaxin 1 and Synaptor 25, are known as Q snares. So don't let that ever confuse you. Now, this complex that they're forming, this has a special name. So where should I write this? Uh, we've left a lot of space over here, so we should write something here. Uh, so this complex that you form is known as a core, a core snare complex. Okay, and uh, there's another sort of tongue-in-cheek name for a core snare complex. It is sometimes you'll see these things referred to as snare pins. Okay, so snare pins, if you ever hear someone talk about a snare pin, they mean a core snare complex, i.e. Synapto Brevin 2 with uh, the um, Snap 25 and Syntaxin 1. And basically what's going to happen is you're going to get this ionic interaction at the zero ionic layer. And then you're also going to get these alpha helices all wrapping up together basically in what's known as the zipper mechanism. Okay, so the zipper mechanism. So in the zipper mechanism what happens is the alpha helices begin wrapping up basically from these free ends here and then they gradually spread downwards and that sort of zips up this connection between the uh, synaptic vesicle and the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's a core snare complex or a snare pin. Now, you don't just form one of these snare pins between uh, the synaptic vesicle and the plasma membrane. Instead, you form multiple. So let me draw another one to make it nicely symmetric. So here's the Synaptor Brevin 2, here's Syntaxin 1, and here's Snap 25. So let me colour it in to make everything more obvious. So this is Synaptor Brevin 2 in orange. Uh, this is, um, this is um, Snap 25 in turquoise. Okay. And this is Syntaxin 1 in blue here. Right. Okay. Now... What stops these core snare complexes from actually fusing the two membranes together? This is a mystery, but in some sense, there is an answer, and it's these complexin proteins. Now, let me explain a bit of the background here. Um, basically, snare proteins are not just used in neurotransmitter release. They are used all over the cell where two membranes have to fuse together. Remember, a major way that you transport things around the cell is in vesicles. So, for instance, you often make proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum which you want transported to the Golgi. They are moved in vesicles, so-called COP2 coated vesicles. Those vesicles are going to have to fuse with the Golgi. How does that occur? It occurs by the formation of core snare complexes like these. Uh, they don't involve the same snare proteins. They involve different snare proteins, but the principle is effectively the same, uh, that you form these core snare complexes which wrap up in this zipper mechanism and then pull the two membranes very close together. But in those cases, the two membranes just fuse instantly. But in the case of the plasma, in the case of sorry, axon terminals, that doesn't happen. Instead, what happens is these core snare complexes they stop, they fall short basically of actually fusing the two membranes together, and instead they just dock the vesicles at this presynaptic membrane, uh, and they are then stored in this readily releasable state, and known as the readily releasable vesicle pool. Okay, now what stops this um, snare complex from zipping up enough that it's going to fuse these two together? Well, basically, there are these proteins known as complexins. Now, let me discuss with you uh, complexin proteins then. And we'll do it in this sort of space that I've left, bizarrely, down here. Okay, so complexin proteins. Firstly, let me say that there are two major types that you find in the brain. Complexin 1, okay, complexin 1, and complexin 2. 
Now, they are nearly and nearly utterly identical in structure. So, it's very, very difficult to tell these two isoforms of complexin apart. Uh, and they're nearly identical, as far as we can tell, in function. What they are not identical in is where they are actually positioned. Basically, what you find is if you go into a neuron in the brain, you will find usually one or the other. You will find either complexin 1 or you will find complexin 2. So basically, if I draw a model of the brain, I don't actually know the distribution of these proteins, but what I do know is that they're complementary effectively. So if this is our brain here, so there's the pons, spinal cord, cerebellum back here, okay? Right, uh, so um, basically, if we, fi if we say we'll find complexin 1, which will denote in orange, in these regions of the brain, so let's say here, 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 then you'll find complexin 2 everywhere else. So every neuron basically has one or the other, and generally it only uses one. So th they do effectively the same function, and where one is, the other won't be needed, and where the other isn't, where that one isn't, where complexin 1 isn't, you'll need complexin 2 instead. So basically, the distribution of complexin 2 is the complement of the distribution of complexin 1. That's all this picture was meant to um, show. Okay, uh, so um, these two proteins, what's their structure and what do they actually do? Right, so their structure is very similar to the snare proteins. Basically, they have an alpha helix. So I'll draw it here. They have an alpha helix, and they can sort of align with the snare protein. So I'll draw them in vivid purple to make them more visible. So with what happens, basically, is these complexin proteins, they associate with the core snare complexes. So here in vivid purple is a complexin protein um, uh, complexing with these um, snare complexes, with these snare pins. Okay, and basically what you find is that they are anti-parallel to these other alpha helices. So basically they have their carboxyl terminus over here and their amino terminus over here. So let me denote their amino terminus there. So their amino terminus is at the end uh, where the snare proteins are anchored into their membranes and their carboxy terminus is at the end where the snare proteins have their free ends. That's the opposite way to which the snare proteins are. The snare proteins such as synaptobrevin 2 and syntaxin, which are specifically the ones which complexin seems to interact with, they have their amino termini at this free end over here and their carboxyl termini are over here in the met in the membranes, basically. Okay, right. So this complexin protein interacts with these snare proteins. It specifically sort of sits in between the alpha helix of synaptobrevin 2 and syntaxin 1 there. And basically, what it appears to do is it stops these core snare complexes uh, from uh, seeming together fully and stops them from pulling the two membranes together. So complexin 1 seems to be involved in stopping the coarse air complexes from causing the fusion of the uh, presynaptic vesicle, uh, sorry, the synaptic vesicle with the plasma membrane. And this sort of idea uh, that it's this sort of clamp protein that stops the two membranes from being fused together is known as the clamp theory. So complexins are very involved in the clamp hypothesis or the clamp theory, uh, which is a theory as to why uh, the uh, synaptic vesicles don't fuse with the plasma membrane uh, until you get a calcium signal, basically, until an action potential arrives in the axon terminal. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.